All right. Well, welcome this evening to what is our last episode of the boardroom series, How Time Flies. We've done four boardroom programs, five actually, I think we did five this year in 2022, and this marks the last one. So I'm glad you're with us tonight. I'm Bonnie McEwen with the State Library. I'm the consultant for the Northwest District, and I'm joined tonight by Sam Bowers, our continuing education consultant at the State Library. And we have a special guest star tonight as well. Rachel Onuf has logged in all the way from Vermont. So how do you like that? When last we looked at registration numbers, we were at 91 logged in. So that, um, or 91 uh, registrants, we hope that many will log in. There may very well be more than that actually uh, listening and watching if you're doing a watch party at your library. So in the chat space, do let us know that. We've heard from Woodbine and Cherokee and a few others where several trustees have gathered together to watch tonight. And I really like that approach to online learning. I think it makes it so much more social that way. So this is the last in our boardroom series, and it's called Policy Watch, Policy Topics Lost and Found. Here's where we're headed tonight. We'll take a quick look at the standards that are connected to library policies. Not surprisingly, there are a few. And then we'll look at some of those policy topics that we refer to as lost, which really, Sam, what Sam and I mean by that are those policies that aren't quite as often addressed, where they're not quite as commonly found in your policy portfolios as other topics are. So we'll take a look at four of those. The board's role in disaster preparedness is one of those, and you'll hear lots more about that in just a few minutes when we welcome Rachel into the presentation. But Sam and I will also touch on policies like social media and programming and holiday closing since the holidays are upon us. The those are some other topics that are often not quite as frequently addressed. We'll welcome your comments and your questions. If you want to fire those up in chat, we'll make sure to circle back to those and try to um, answer as many of those as we can tonight. This is being recorded and you'll receive um, a notice of the recording and the slides in about a week's time. So. It is important, I think, to connect standards to the topics we talk about, and we there we can always be pretty assured that we will find standards connected to almost every topic we talk about at the State Library, and policies are no exception. These are two standards that are policy related. Standard number seven, required at a tier one level, requires that a library board adopt four policy categories, circulation, collections, personnel, and internet use. And we know those are not the only four you have in your policy manual. You probably have many more than that. Standard number nine, then, though not required, does suggest that the board adopts more than just those four, and you probably have more than those four. You probably have policies on meeting rooms and makerspaces, and you may very well have policies on um, these other these other categories, like these you see on the screen. These are some of the additional policy topics that you could have that maybe some of you have some of them, maybe some of you have all of them. Um, but I found in my experience that some of these topics to tend to be among those that are least often addressed, which puts them in our policies lost category. Now, HR, I've mentioned, is one that is required at a tier one level. So no doubt you have an HR policy, but it could be that there are some subcategories within the larger category of personnel or HR that maybe you haven't thought to include, like, for instance, what do you do about job performance evaluations? What about um, determining 
mileage reimbursement when the staff heads out of the building to workshops and conferences? What about education expenses? Maybe you're even able to garner a little bit of your budget money to put toward paying for the memberships into things like the Iowa Library Association or the Public Library Association. Maybe you have money enough to do that for your director and your board president. Those are kind of subcategories within HR. And you probably, as, as the slide on the, the square on the left shows a, a policy on public safety, you probably have addressed safe child, safe children and unattended children in the library, the what ifs behind that. But have you maybe considered what to be done in terms of emergency evacuation? What about making sure that your safety equipment is inspected? What about encouraging your staff to do safety, public safety kinds of training at least every year? Rachel has much more about those public safety issues coming up in her presentation. So you'll hear more about disaster preparedness shortly. But as you look at this list, what we wanted to do is ask of you which of tonight's lost policies, um, policy topics has your library addressed. We're only going to bring forward um, the top the top four that we're going to talk about tonight. Did you have a poll for this one, Bon? I do. And here it goes. While Bon's pulling that up, I'll um, tell you all that our initial sort of working title for this um, for this session was the the Island of Misfit Policies, uh, which is a nod to the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoon, uh, which I kind of liked, um, but it didn't maybe quite quite ring ring true. Uh, so we we found this policy. Bonnie was uh, able to come up with this much perhaps more. Uh, what do we call it? Informative title, a title that actually <laughs> means something uh, besides Island of of Misfit policies but well policy watch might also come to be the name of a series that we might do in the new year we don't know yet we're just kind of kicking around that idea so it could be a series title too you never know Ooh, wouldn't that be fun so those of you who have your hands on the keyboard and can um, answer this question on behalf of your library, we're only asking about tonight's lost policy topics, disaster preparedness, social media, programming, and holiday closings. So go ahead and chime in. It's multiple choice, so you can answer one or more or all. And we'll give it just a few more, a few more seconds here. All right, shall we share the results with the world? All right, here's what you all said. That 40% of the group said yes to disaster preparedness policies, but a smaller number said that they have addressed social media and programming. But look at that. I'm cheered to see what a big percentage of you tonight have said that you have, in fact, addressed holiday closings. So, hey, when we get to that part, um, I'll be speaking to the choir. So consider that choir practice then, okay? Um, this is good, yeah? There you go, Rachel. There is, uh, there's your percentage for the folks in the audience who have turned their attention to disaster preparedness. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'd love to hear from especially those folks who have developed policy around disaster preparedness for their library. Um, be great for you to share, to share with your colleagues. Um, so we'll make sure we have plenty of time for that as well. All right, well, should I go ahead and get started, Bonnie? 
Yes, please do. We are so happy to welcome Rachel Onuf with us. She has logged in from Vermont. She's with the Vermont Historical Records Program, and it makes it sound like she, you know, she drove all the way. Um, but here she is, not once but twice, joining us as in Iowa libraries. She joined us in October, um, virtually again, with a Zoom meeting that, that the State Library sponsored called our Learning Circuit that was held in October. And Rachel was one of the keynote speakers at that event. And because her topic was disaster related policies, we asked her to come back this evening and share with us her perspective on the board's role in developing disaster policies. So Rachel, we're glad to have you with us. And it's all yours. Oh, Do you thank think you, I could jump in with one with one quick thing, Bon? Yes. I should have run this by you. And Rachel, I apologize for, for talking an extra couple minutes here, but I thought it might be, um, do you mind if I talk just a couple seconds here about why we are talking about disaster policy? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, so the State Library of Iowa um, continuing education team likes to pick a theme every year where we sort of focus our education efforts. And our theme this year, this past year of 2022, has been make room for yes. And so we've kind of done lots of things on the topic of, you know, like out with the old, in with the new, um, be thinking in fresh in fresh ways about what your library can, can do and be in its community. Um, but this idea of disaster planning and disaster preparedness kind of just kept coming up. Of course, we've um, we've done the pandemic thing. We are doing the pandemic thing, um, which, of course, is a disaster that in one way or another affected all our libraries. But, of course, also in the last couple of years, we've had derechos, uh, tornadoes, floods, fires um, in Iowa libraries. And so disasters sometimes don't wait for you to say yes to them. They often don't wait for you to say yes to them, but uh, perhaps a, a tornado or other disaster has made room for yes for you. And so with a big, with a solid plan in place like this, um, like what your library can put together, um, you will sort of have avoided that, uh, the, the biggest problems that come with not having a plan in place. And so, um, it does feel a little bit out of the blue, but we really strongly felt like this um, This is something we needed to be talking about now. So we've actually had a series on this throughout the fall, and we'll continue to talk about it a little bit. Um, but library directors have probably been seeing stuff from the State Library on this topic. Um, so we're excited now to bring it to boards as well. And I'll stop talking now, but um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Sam, and useful to hear that. Uh, and I also wanted to thank you and Bonnie for this opportunity, um, partly because it it got me to start thinking about disaster preparedness from a different angle. From that, okay, well, what would what would the role of trustees of a public library be? Because more recently, most of the training I've been doing is focused very much on that plan development, on getting a disaster plan in place for your repository, whether it's public libraries or historical societies or museums or town clerk's offices. I work with with a range of different repositories here in Vermont, and and but a lot of the interest in disaster planning has been in public libraries. Um, but there is, there's more to it than just developing a plan. And I really liked that opportunity that you've afforded to think about what folks who are kind of at that governance level might might provide and help out uh, their libraries um, and support that work and, and, and do more beyond that as well. Uh, just to say a bit about VACDARN, which is the other cute logo you see on this slide, that stands for the Vermont Arts and Culture Disaster and Resilience Network, which is, a, well, Vermont's not large, uh, but it is an, a, a big umbrella organization of arts and records repositories that are together to help us all try to be more prepared in the event of a disaster within the arts and culture sector broadly defined. Um, and we've been fortunate in that aside from the notable exception of the pandemic, uh, which has been something of a slow moving disaster, at least in terms of its impact on collections, um, we haven't had, you know, 
a tropical storm Irene like we had 11 years ago to to really motivate us or to to get us activated but we're prepared to be activated and as I'll talk about tonight part of the the long haul of disaster preparedness is that there's always it's an iterative process and there's always more that can be done and that you need to keep refreshed in order to be prepared to act in the event that there is uh, an incident, as emergency managers like to talk about it, that, that requires some sort of response. So, uh, Bonnie, next slide, please. I'll just show you what the agenda is for, for my, my time with you tonight. And again, I love that so many of you have some experience with policy development around disaster preparedness, and I hope we can have a great discussion later on. But I do want to talk a bit about why disaster preparedness is important for your library, and then specifically some things that I identified as potential role of trustees in that process. Again, it's not, it's not a one and done type thing. It's not even if you make a plan it's not then okay we're good we're done with that we're going to put it on the shelf i'll i'll put it next to all those other those other policies and we're we're all set we can we can let the the library know we're all we're prepared um you really need to engage with that and to keep it keep it up to date and keep your staff and anyone else involved in being prepared and potentially responding to a disaster, you need to keep them um, engaged as well. So there is uh, these four things I've identified is probably fairly obvious considering the topic tonight is policy development and what the board might do in terms of, of having some sort of overarching disaster preparedness policy. Uh, getting involved in the actual disaster planning uh, which usually does end up with a document, but it's as much, there's great value in that working through that, that, that plan um, in terms of, of learning more about your community, about your collections, about your priorities, about who, who you can reach out to. And we'll, we'll go through the basic sections of a plan together in a little bit. Um, and then this, this idea of, of cultivating a culture of preparedness. Again, as I was saying, it's hard to keep it top of mind. It's hard to even prioritize it uh, because it's always just, you're hoping it's this latent thing that you never actually have to activate. And yet you're somehow supposed to keep it, keep it alive and keep it up to date and keep it, keep Keep an awareness of it in place. And I think this is an important place for, for trustees uh, to be the squeaky wheel and to keep, keep that part of, of your gestalt, of what you talk about, of what you're thinking of, about, about your culture in your in your library. And another thing you can bring to the, the, the table is a familiarity with emergency management structure or specifically connections to folks who are involved in emergency management at your local level. Um, you may know the fire chief, you may know the police chief, you may have working relationships with other officials at town at the town hall that that can help um, that the libraries need to be prepared um, and get a good response. You can really can really facilitate that by being familiar with the people and with how emergency management functions because it's it's kind of a different beast. Um, next slide, please, Bonnie. So getting into the why, uh, and some of this uh, probably fairly obvious, but as as Sam was alluding to, if you if there is a, an emergency scenario, and it, it may even be something, I mean, the, the place where I work, the state archives, I, we haven't had a fire drill in years. And I kind of feel like if we had, even if it was just simply a drill, I'm not sure we would all know how, where we're, how do we do we sweep the reading room and who's responsible for making sure our patrons are out and where are we congregating outside and you know we have a lot of new staff who we've never told where to go um so even just practicing can help um with with some of that human safety issues um and certainly then if you have practiced it's much more likely that when there is an actual emergency and it's not just a drill folks are going to do what they need to do to make sure that again health and human safety first make sure that people are safe and then to the extent 
needed um, to address issues around the collections. So a plan will really help you know what to do and how to do it. Um, Cause there's also that massive adrenaline rush when you do hear an alarm or someone says fire, or you see someone fall flat on the floor um, having a heart attack. Uh, what do I do now? Um, and if you, again, practice makes it second nature, but if you're not sure what to do, at least having some sort of document to refer to, and it might be kind of the obvious looking at it and saying, oh, right, call 911. Um, again, hopefully that's ingrained in most of us, but it, it may be very useful to have something that'll lead you through some steps. Um, and if you have a plan, it's going to make it more likely that you'll be able to protect, because I say the safety of people and of property, you'll be able to have the an, an ability to get back to your normal operations more quickly, less losses. Um, and this idea that more prepared organizations also means a more resilient community, um, especially uh, public libraries are now seen as it's assumed there's a certain expectation in many communities that you will be a hub, you'll be a shelter, a warming space, a, a charging station, a center for information about what is going on. So it's it's really, it's imperative that you all are able to be up and running as soon as possible. And the, that community expectation can also work to your advantage in that it might mean that you are prioritized if there is a need for, um, if it is you know a, a disaster that hits a larger area than just your building, they might prioritize making sure the library is safe and secure so that the community can come in and use it and be safe there. Um, so that can work to your advantages. And disasters are recurring with more frequency as Sam enumerated um, some of the recent natural disasters that you've experienced in your state. Um, and if you look at the next, next slide, I'll just show you an example uh, from Vermont of an historical society where it also, it can, it can strike twice. So the Poor Thetford Historical Society in, in 2017, they had a, and this is July, and this is one of the increasing risks we have in Vermont is of torrential downpours. So this was a downpour that that put four inches of rain on the ground in about an hour, flooded a brook, which flooded these historic barns. Um, and then less than two years later, someone drove their car into the same into the same barn. Again, this is a localized, but it's it can show it'll strike twice. The other thing to remember is that you never get to really to experience the same disaster twice. It's always going to be something different, which is, again, why part of the importance of the practicing is to practice flexibility and adaptability and working through scenarios where you have to kind of imagine out different types of situations can be really helpful for that. Um, that said, you can often, you will, it's useful to identify what you are most at risk for in your, in your library um, and, and make sure you plan and prepare for those. Um, there will always be those, the other types of disasters that you would never expect to see. When I worked in Massachusetts, you know, we never, tornadoes, no, but then we had a tornado that damaged a lot of buildings in, in Springfield and some towns around there. Um, so you, that, that would not, it was a low risk, and yet it is possible. Next slide, please. So, yeah, we tend to focus, especially, we obsess about natural disasters in part because, you know, we can, they're, they're, they're out there, they're happening to us, but it's useful to think about other types of scenarios that could also become disasters. Um, and you might wonder, I find it useful to think about, you know, we use the word emergency or emergency management. We talk about disasters. Uh, I, there's a useful definition I found of an emergency, a disaster is an emergency that's gotten out of control, like that you cannot manage without, without its outside assistance. Um, so some of these things are, you know, they can identify them as kind of everyday disasters. You might have a fire in a specific, in one building. There might be 
a power outage that could be localized or it could be widespread. You could have a medical emergency um, and they're going to require slightly different responses depending on, on what type they are. And then there, there are, of course, many man-made, and you, you could make the comment, of course, that some of the natural disasters are ultimately man-made, but we will still put those on the mother nature side of things. Um, and talk specifically about cyber attacks and acts of violence or terrorism. Um, or uh, it's also useful to think about when you're doing a kind of a risk assessment, are you close to railroad lines that carry hazardous materials? And what would happen if there was a spill? Um, how close are waterways to, um, to and dams to your library? Um, and what being aware of your in or your immediate environment and what sorts of other buildings or industries are around uh, that might be putting your your facility at risk because of the activities that are happening within them. Next slide. So now to get a little bit more into the role of library trustees. Um, so it's important that you articulate at the policy level why disaster preparedness is essential and what the library will do to ensure that it is prepared for disasters. Um, and that policy could probably be fairly succinct. Uh, you can you can you can also go deeper into doing a full fledged risk assessment or seeing what the state hazard mitigation plan has identified as the highest risks for your area. Um, you also want to kind of lay out, but at a high level, what your library will do to ensure it's prepared for disasters. Um, and you don't want to let your policy be an unsupported mandate. You want to actively participate in the planning and procedure development and maintenance. Now, it, this may, this is going to vary depending on on your library and what size you your library is, how large the staff is, how well resourced you are. But in in many cases, it's actually the smaller um, and the more the smaller libraries that that really rely on trustees to help with that planning process. There might be in Vermont, we have many single librarian libraries where and they may only work part time. Um, where they do need other other people to help with the plan development. Um, so that could be a role for 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 trustees to do is actually kind of getting into the weeds on the procedure building. And as I mentioned before, connecting with local and state emergency management officials could be really useful. It may be that you, you know, you are trustees of your libraries, you're well connected in your communities, you know everybody, uh, so you can bring that advantage to, to the table. And here's some examples of at the policy level that you could include in what you what you draft. It may be that you say the library will maintain a disaster plan, reviewing and updating it every May Day. So May Day is something that a number of years ago was established just as kind of, again, to, to try to normalize and um, embed refreshing and keeping preparedness top of mind for archives and libraries and buildings and historical societies, kind of all of all of those places. So there, there's often um, promotional campaigns around May Day by some of the the, the larger groups like the Society of American Archivists or the Association for State and Local History, um, encouraging people to review their uh, disaster plan if they have one and if they don't to resolve to start working on one. Um, you can decide that for May Day, you're going to have a tabletop scenario discussion um, over lunch or something like that. You know, use that as an, kind of an opportunity to, to do something disaster preparedness related and know that there are people all around the country doing the same. Um, other examples of policy, Live may be saying you'll conduct fire drills twice a year and a disaster training session for staff and trustees annually. I think it's good to put in time frames. I mean, you don't have to put a date, um, but to say how frequently things will happen. Um, and I, I believe that the 
that, this, that your public library standards volume says that policies should be reviewed every three years or sooner. Um, so you can you can kind of incorporate that into your your best practice. You might also have in your policy that the library will schedule a walkthrough with the local emergency management manager every other year or whenever a new person assumes that position. So again, someone's going to have to kind of keep track of what the things are in the policy that you say you'll do. Um, but that's you know it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be this a tremendous uh, policy. But I'm really curious to hear what some of you who have policies have included in yours. Next slide, please, Bonnie. So in terms of helping out with the plan, the creation of a disaster plan, which is really, it is a wonderful place to start if you don't already have one, um, is to think about your role as a trustee and how you can help out, especially if you have a much a smaller staff um, that 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 you're that you're involved with at your library, because there's components in the plan that draw upon all of these different areas of expertise so administration collections information technology the building uh safety and security as well as the management of the facility and folks that have uh the the authority to make purchasing decisions or or establish contracts and it may be that 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 that's stuff that you have negotiated with with your with your director, but there's still opportunity for you all to be involved in that. Next slide, please. And just so you can kind of start to imagine out what this disaster plan could be, and there's loads of of templates out there, and uh, including one for Iowa, which you'll see in a moment, um, that has these basic sections. Um, you, no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, no need to to include things that are some of this even at this pared down level might be too much for for your library. It can be difficult to develop a template that applies as easily for a library serving a community of of twelve hundred, which is what many of our communities here in Vermont have for population, and one that's you know like the big city of Burlington with like eighteen thousand people. Um, but those that that scaling up can be a challenge in the template. So there may well be stuff in there that is that is that is more than you need. But it, it, the idea is to make it something that, that can be applied um, by all. Uh, so the, the first thing, again, as I said, was that, that kind of call 911 page, uh, immediate response. Who do you call? Okay, so you call 911 potentially. Who else do you call? What, what's your phone tree? Who are you going to be engaging in this process? Um, and that immediately ties in with who's on your disaster response team. Um, and a moment here, too, to talk about response. So there's the best thing we can all do in the response moment is actually probably to get out of the way and let the first responders do what they need to do. But depending on the type of disaster, you know, let's say a big pipe burst on a Friday night and you come in on Monday morning as the librarian and you see the, the base that your basement floor with with all of your your children section and your young adult is completely flooded and the water's still pouring in. There's going to be a need to make some decisions about those collections. There's definitely an impact on collections. Uh, so do you have a team of folks that can help with that once it is cleared for you to go into the building? So you do need a team of people. Again, this is a great place for trustees to participate. Um, and in terms of developing a plan, it's much better to involve the folks who are on your response team in that plan development rather than create the plan. Um, you know, if you're sitting there as a library director going, oh, it'd be just so much easier for me to do this by myself and then hand it to people and then tell them what their roles are, that's it's going to be more difficult to get buy-in and all that important stuff um, than if you have people involved in the planning process. Other things that the disaster plans typically include are emergency services and contacts. You know, you have a big hole in the roof. Who's your who's your roofer or who's your contractor? You need to to get a new lock put on. Who's your locksmith? Who's your plumber? All those, and you may have this information in various places, but gathering it into into the one document and making sure that the contact information stays up to date 
can be really helpful. One area that can be challenging for lots of, of smaller places and less so for public libraries and historical societies is, is knowing what your insurance policy is, the name of your agent, the number, what your policy actually says, what, it, what is covered up to what amount, um, and what they would like you to do in the event of a disaster. Like, can you go ahead and start making calls to disaster recovery vendors? Or um, do they want you to take photos as soon as you're able to get into the space? Do they want their adjuster there before anything happens? Just, ha again, conversations can be really useful. And it may make sense um, for your library for you to be involved in that process um, or, um, or, or, or some aspect of it. Facilities, I work with some folks who, it is a trustee who actually is in kind of in charge of the building, who knows it best um, and has that kind of history of, of past, past issues and problems. Um, so that may be a role that you are playing for your library as well. Having a supply of disaster response materials can be useful. Although in some, <laughs> I see these very elaborate disaster supply inventories. And I think, how about just everybody have, every library in the land have a bunch of plastic sheeting and that would, you know, we'd all probably be better off, um, but there's all sorts of things you can get. Um, so again, you might, it might be helpful for you to, you could crowdsource some of this stuff. Like anyone have box fans you're not using. Um, and again, you don't want to inundate the library, which probably has limited space with too many supplies, but if you have them off site, can you know? Do, are they close by? Who's who is closest? Is there a trustee who lives close by who could kind of hold some of this stuff in the event that it's needed? Um, so there's a lot. Again, you might be getting the sense of this document is actually kind of gathering lots of information together. Another place where it can be really helpful to have trustees involved is in discussing salvage priorities. Uh, do you have art? And artifacts? Do you have a local history collection? Are there unique and rare materials that are not easily replaceable? Those ought to be your priorities for salvage. Um, and being able to identify those in advance um, can be really helpful. And sometimes this exercise is a motivator for organizations that maybe say, oh yeah, we've got we got two filing cabinets. Uh, there's a vertical file. There's all sorts of stuff in there. Haven't really looked at it don't really know what's there, it might be good to get a better sense of that and identify what are particularly unique materials to make sure that those can be can be identified as things you would prioritize for, for salvage. And it's good to keep information in your plan about the plan. Um, this can be like when it was created, when it was updated, um, and uh, what other resources you used in coming up with your plan. Next slide, Bonnie. So here's the Iowa disaster plan template, and you'll see it has a lot of these same categories and breaks them down a little bit. So you'll see under, for instance, facilities, you'll see uh, floor plans included and where the main utilities are and the shutoff valves, um, things that would be useful to know and to have written down so that if the person who is actually on the scene uh, doesn't know this stuff, is not the facilities person, they can go and shut off a water main if that's what really needs to, to happen. So lots, lots in this template that'll kind of guide you in your information gathering phase. Um, and, and you can see how on the one hand, it's not, it's not big, it's 12 pages. I mean, it'll be a little bigger once you add your information, but this is not, this is not a massive plan. Um, there was a trend a few years ago to have like these really thick plans. Um, the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Massachusetts has a uh, an online template called D Plan, and it's recently been revived and made leaner uh, and more inclusive of arts organizations. But it used to be uh, when I would teach for for Simmons Library School, my students would write disaster plans for actual institutions. And the thing that came out was about a hundred, over a hundred pages because it included a lot of specifics about how you would actually salvage a book um, and what is damp as opposed to wet as opposed to soaking wet and, you know, kind of leading you through all sorts of process 
on the recovery side of things, um, which is what happens after response. But we're hanging out mainly in preparedness land, but I'll talk a little bit about some of this other stuff when we get into uh, emergency management. So next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about strategies, it is it is small, but it is slightly tedious. Um, and your library director might be very grateful to have you um, pitch in and say you'll, you'll be responsible for some some component of it. Or maybe you're the person who rides herd and keeps people on deadline um, and can can kind of keep everyone else moving forward in their in their different areas. So whatever's going to work for you, but just to think about these different, these different uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan of chunking um, in all aspects of things. So think how can you break things into manageable parts and then divvy them up and and you know guilt each other into doing them or you know food works really well usually too so it doesn't have to be a bad and not a negative thing keep it positive speaking of keeping it positive uh, next slide please bonnie um again back to this idea of cultivating a culture of preparedness so again you guys do governance so you get to set the agenda so keep this kind of activity on your agenda um see that there's a way to integrate you don't have to be crazy about it but every year maybe do something preparedness related um other ideas i had and i'd love to hear from you all as well about what you've done is potentially including coordinating disaster preparedness, you know, actually naming it in uh, the job resp responsibilities of the library director uh, or some other staff, if you've got a larger staff. Uh, use existing opportunities to talk about disaster preparedness to do things locally. So there's May Day, as I already mentioned, but there's also National Preparedness Month, um, which is September. Uh, and consider, consider programming for the broader community you know there's great resources out there like ready.gov um, to help families uh, be better prepared for disasters so you could you could host programs and coordinate and i'm sure it sounded like when aj Seeley was talking to the librarians last month you know they would love to do they do and would love to do more of this programming at at libraries for communities to to make them more aware of the resources that are available and the steps they can take to make sure their family stays safe uh, in the event of of a disaster and then oh, this idea of action of training um, again the plan itself the process can be helpful and stimulating and get you thinking but then once you've actually completed the plan, now what? Uh, so the idea of putting the plan into action is, is as important as the creation of the plan. Next slide, please. So training, and there's different types you can do. It can be as simple as sitting around it at a at a table with a scenario that you then spin out um and just and i have a few on the next slide i'll show you and you just kind of walk through that scenario and what would you do with that scenario in your specific library what is how does that play out there uh you can also do uh, hands-on stuff um and this is where working with local emergency management can be great i mean have have are you are people comfortable using a fire extinguisher have they had uh the fire chief kind of vet what the drill process is for evacuation um can be really great to have one of them observe what you do when when that when that alarm gets pulled uh, we also in Vermont we did a couple collection salvage exercises because it's 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 you don't really know like a wet book is really heavy so it's it can be helpful to have experienced that in a training environment before you actually have to do it and it's your library's books you know like that's there's an emotional toll to going through disaster that I think we're getting a lot better about talking about. Um, but it's still you can you can prepare for that by, you know, I would bring in, oh, books I'd gotten at the dump and, you know, mix them in with water and ashes and dirt and then had people try to you know lovingly bring them back to some sort of shape and it, it's better to do that with a no offense to danielle Steele, but with a danielle Steele um a book or you know and name your author if you know one of those 
than with something that is, you know, your county history that is inscribed by uh, the guy who paid for the library to be built, you know. Uh, so use some, get practice. Again, one of my, one of my words for tonight. That practice can even get more grand. And I have only, I observed a full scale simulation in that we got a lot of deaccession collection materials together at the fire training facility in Massachusetts. And there was a lot of, there was NEH funding to do this. Um, and we said that the firemen set it all on fire, let it burn for a few minutes, and then put the fire out. And then we let it sit for the weekend. And then the participants came back on Monday and tried to salvage the stuff that had actually been through this, this simulation of a, well, it was an actual fire, but we were simulating what would happen in, in, a, in a library space. And again, there's nothing quite like seeing something that has been burned and having to make those triage decisions about what's salvageable, what's a total loss, um, and what can you do to try to, to, to preserve some of these things. And there's a lot of external resources out there for help. So I know Sam and uh, and your regional coordinators like Bonnie can be a great resource. And there's there's a lot of things nationally um, as well as regionally that can support you in that. I know you've got conservation groups out there too who are willing to help with uh, with practicing. Next slide, please. So just briefly, because I'm going on and on, um, here's some scenarios you could con consider just to give you an idea of what I'm what I'm thinking. You might sit around and talk about while you eat your tuna fish sandwiches. So torrential rains are expected to hit in three hours with widespread flash flooding. Again, you're gonna, it's helpful if you've already done a risk assessment and you know, are you in a floodplain? Have you experienced floods before? Um, do you have storm doors that you can put in place? Do you have sandbags, do, you know, things like that. Um, another one, the power goes out while the library is hosting an annual Friends of the Library holiday party. Like, do you have emergency lighting that kicks on? Do you have flashlights? Do you, what would your protocol be? Um, again, some of these are pretty minor, but you also, it's important, especially when you're dealing with lots of people to keep it from becoming chaotic. Cause when people panic, that's when really bad things can happen. Um, and then it can also be the, 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 the one person acting on their own. So someone in distress shouting, shouting obscenities and splashing the new fiction display with some unknown liquid. Like how do you, how do you manage that kind of a situation? Uh, and, and that may be something where, again, there's, there's, there's resources out there that can help, um, help with how do you deescalate situations um, and, and keep that person safe, keep everyone else safe as well. Uh, and then the young adult section in the library basement, as I mentioned earlier, filling with water. How do you how do you respond to that? So it can be pretty simple. Um, but next slide, please, Bonnie. You can also get into more tabletop exercises where you're actually kind of, as I say, exercising your disaster response plan. You're getting into a little bit more detail. Like, okay, so how does this document we've created apply to the situation that we're now envisioning happening? Is this use, is this document useful? Um, is there stuff we didn't include? Uh, or is it is it is it gonna is it gonna be a good a good tool for helping us out? Uh, Library of Congress has some sample scenarios and questions to talk through as well. And then Brandeis put up this really elaborate um, IT related scenario if you want to kind of get into the weeds on that as well. So the last thing I want to talk about tonight is uh, just a brief overview of emergency management. So next slide, and we can zoom to the next one. So I just want to bring out, we're talking about, most of this is about preparedness, but these phases are, it's one of four phases. Some Sometimes you see five phases, um, but it's prepare, then you respond during the actual disaster, then you do recovery after it, and that recovery can be pretty quick and it can go on for years or something in between. So it that's really going to depend. Um, uh, and it's interesting to, you know, I'm thinking about the flooding in Florida recently and, you know, the politicians saying, we're going to rebuild, we're going to rebuild better and thinking, how about you mitigate that situation and nobody builds there again? They move, and it's very sad. And I, you know, and I am sorry for the folks who are losing their homes, their home place. But 
it the idea of kind of continuing to 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 stay in place is something we need to be more flexible about. And that's where I get into mitigation, this, this fourth part of the, of the circle of this continuum. And in Vermont, at least, there's some hazard mitigation funds going to buy people out. So if your house is in a floodplain, there is the potential to get paid for your house. Your house then gets leveled. And then when that space floods again, it's not a disaster because there's no house there. Um, it's been it's reverted back to being a sponge, a place that can uh, can can accept water, can handle that water until it's until it gets absorbed. So that whole mitigation, this is kind of it's my favorite part actually, is that you think about how can we reduce the risk of needing to have to respond to a disaster? Um, how can you minimize the risk, or how can you you know, if you're really lucky, you can eradicate some risks, but in most cases, you're just trying to minimize the risk. Um, and there's there's strategies, depending on what the risks are that you identify, that you can take to do that work. Um, but you can see this is, this is, it is, it's a continuum, it's ongoing. This is back to that kind of culture of preparedness and, and the emergency mindset, the emergency management mindset. So next slide. I'm not gonna dwell on these much, but just, just to, just to highlight that emergency managers speak their own special language. So they speak about incidents and they do HIRAs, or sometimes they call them thyras. that's threat and hazard identification and risk assessment. They set up EOCs when there's a situation, um, when there's an incident, I mean. They implement the ICS when there is a situation to respond to, um, and there is a NIMS, and they they address different types of scenarios through things they call partner annexes. So the emergency management plan for Vermont has a partner annex for cultural heritage, for instance, that kind of says, yes, these are the folks who will be involved if cultural heritage is affected. Um, in the course of a of a disaster, and uh, then they also talk about damage assessment, which is is pretty regular English right there. There is a primer. Next slide, please. About emergency management, um, if you if you kind of want to get into that mindset, there is a handbook David Carmichael created uh, for libraries, archives, and museums about implementing the ICS at the at your institution. Um, and again, there's lots of forms and and kind of primer on how to how to understand the language and the structure, which is very hierarchical. And you can see why it would have to be, because if you have a large scale response, you're going to have you might have, you know, fire trucks from eight different localities and police and EMTs and, and on who's in charge. So there's a real need to establish that and to set up roles so that there can be an effective, uh, an effective and efficient response. Next slide, please. So I exhorted you all to connect with emergency responders and that this is something that you might be able to, to do on behalf of your library. Um, and again, I would do this all in close collaboration with your staff, uh, but you can have folks do walkthroughs, invite them to events, um, have them come and give you advice about about your planning process or about your drills um, and and see if they'd be up for for doing some of those activities at at your place and there's important things for you to impart to emergency managers as well um, this idea that that you are a, a community hub and you hold collective memory and culture and resources and that you are an information center for for your 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 town um and some of your collections may be irreplaceable and that can be very useful to communicate and to make sure they understand where they are because they do have some discretion over where they hold that hose and where they blast the water so if they know that they want to try to um, protect certain areas they can they can direct the water away from that if they're responding to a fire um, or they could even take the time to if they have them to put uh, to put protective tarps over those materials before they they start blasting. 
Um, and yeah, again, if they're not already aware, uh, make sure that they know that you are, if you are, if your building is that kind of, has that kind of capacity that you can be uh, a gathering space in the event that there's a community-wide uh, disaster. And make sure that they know what your layout is, uh, where where they can get in without breaking down doors necessarily, uh, where where the different locations for shutoffs are, and all of that. And again, you keep an eye on who's if there's been a turnover in staff because that you might you'll have to. That's another opportunity <laughs> to begin all again with uh, that relationship building. And finally, just one more slide to show you, just, just to point out that there's many layers of emergency assistance available to you. I would definitely start local, start with your town or city emergency management director, but there are going to be folks, depending on how things are organized, uh, where, that are better useful to you at the county level, um, at the state level, there's always FEMA. Um, but if you can work through one of your local um, folks to get to FEMA, that's probably best. There's also uh, the NEDCC, I mentioned them earlier, has a 24-7 emergency hotline. You can always connect with someone there who can give you advice specifically around collections if you have an impact there. And my next slide is just to say thank you. Uh, this has been great and I look forward to discussion. And don't hesitate to be in touch, please. Thank you, Rachel. Sam, I have a thought. What's this? I have a thought that would, but this depends on Rachel, actually. If Rachel can stay with us. Can you? Well, or are I was you ready to? I oh, was good. To. Oh, yeah. good. I want to hear about these policies. Well, <laughs> well, my thought, my thought was that um, what if we used our remaining time with Rachel staying with us to find out what those uh, what all of you who said you had disaster prepped plans at your libraries, if you could share your experience or if you have any questions to um, ask of Rachel while we have her. She is of such tremendous value in this topic. She has incredible expertise in this that I certainly don't have. I certainly can't claim. Um, and, and so I wondered if, if we could kind of pivot um, and flex flex the rest of our time to be Rachel, and then we can always circle back. Sam and I are here forever, so we can always circle back to these other lost policy topics when we meet again in the new year. You tell me what what you all um, think about that idea. Sam, what do you think? I am game for that. Um, I haven't had any supper, so me presenting on an em empty stomach is always a dangerous proposition anyway. So we can, I would certainly love to hear feedback from librarians who have worked their way through the plan, maybe from board members who have been tapped at one time or another in the past few weeks. Um, if there's a board member here who's like, yeah, starting in October, my librarian really started bothering me about getting on this plan business. Uh, that, <laughs> that fault would lie with the state library. And we want to hear from you, too. Sam, can you? Never mind. I've got it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Never mind. There we are. I lost all I lost all controls there for a moment. But oh, okay. Um, what do what do you all what do you all think about that? Let us let us know as we as we look to kind of flex the remaining part of our evening tonight to um, include Rachel in on any of your um, questions that you have for her specific to disaster planning and to share any of your experiences. Those of you who said that you've uh, been down this road. We would love to hear from you. And you know what, Sam, it also occurs to me that this would be a great time for you, maybe as they're thinking of questions um, for Rachel, for you to share um, your screen and take them to our disaster preparedness toolkit because we showed you in Rachel's portion of the slides, we showed you a slide that said, welcome to Iowa's disaster planning template. But then I realized the slide neglected to tell you that that's on our website. And Sam can take you there now just to make sure that you all are aware of this brand new resource that came to us at the State Library, thanks in large part 
to um, Sam's work on this, prepping for our learning circuit workshop in October. Sam poured herself into this topic, I'm going to tell you that right now, summer and fall, and it resulted in um, this disaster preparedness toolkit. It's a brand new resource, so we want to make sure you're aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. And then I would invite folks to, um, in your Zoom controls, you have the ability to raise your hand if you do want to come off mute and talk. So while I'm doing that, you guys be thinking about how this has gone in your library in the next, in the last few months um, as well, if you do want to come off mute. Um, so while you're prepping those stories, let me show you the disaster preparedness toolkit that we've put together here. Um, the, the crowning jewel of which, of course, is our template. I do want to say for those who are following along with my typos at home, that yesterday I caught a typo in this title block right here, which makes me feel like the queen of the world. And this has been up for about six weeks. So for all of you who have read and loved and used this resource and not told me about the typo, thanks for nothing. Um, but all that to say, the typo has been fixed now, and I'm really pleased to share this uh, this document with you. You'll see right here, Rachel's organization um, credited. Rachel was hugely helpful um, as we were putting this topic together. And then, yeah, as Bonnie said, I kind of took advantage of a slow summer and really dive, dived, dove um, into this. So um, you can download the template itself, which has all those different sections that Rachel outlined uh, right here at this at this link. Um, I also have this YouTube playlist, which is linked right down below that goes over some um, just kind of highlights of each of those parts of the plan. So um, what everything from completing your disaster response team um, down through starting to gather supplies, um, all of that is sort of detailed here in this plan and uh, downloaded but did not open. Hang on, Chrome has a new way of doing things. So here is that plan. Uh, Rachel said um, it's not a ton of pages long. Um, obviously, there's a lot here that you can delete if it's not relevant to your library. Um, you can add things in if there are things you need, but we really do want this to be um, in an easily accessible place in your library, most of this information uh, to whoever happens to be working the, the front desk, because you know this disaster is not going to strike when your director is working, it's going to strike when she's on vacation somewhere warm and has turned off her cell phone and said, do not bother me for any reason at all. And so um, you want, you certainly want whoever steps in to manage an issue um, to be well prepared. And um, I also like to remind people, we just um, heard an example of this in a panel of libraries from around the state of Iowa. Um, you know, when the derecho hit, for example, the Marion Public Library was completely taken offline, as were the homes of several Marion library staffers. And so not only were those staffers perhaps unable to fulfill their roles and responsibilities as members of this plan, um, they were also you know, wishing they had a plan like this for their home. And so having a diverse set of people on this list is going to, as much as you can, is going to be extremely helpful to the overall running of the library. Um, I won't say any more about that right now, but I'll head back to the toolkit for just a second here. Um, we do have the recordings. Tonight's recording will be edited here once it's processed. Uh, some additional resources as well highlighted here. Um, we also, um, in our learning circuit day, talked through some scenarios. I don't know if this is really tiny on your screen, how much I can blow it up, but, um, you know, everything from snow and ice, which Iowans are well familiar to, uh, to perhaps a, um, a set of uh, citizen unrest. Um, so all things that are worth thinking about, as well as a collection of resources that are available to you. Um, uh, Rachel mentioned ready.gov. That is linked here. This is a great resource, and I'd encourage libraries to even think about programming around this. Um, they have lots of things from um, having a, a family prep their own kit. Um, that would a great ready-made library program that would make 
um, if you can talk a, talk a family through prepping their own kit, um, to some more things for institutions as well. But um, all of those links here. I did want to highlight one which I just learned about, um, which is the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. So this was shared by a library a librarian here in Iowa who went through a disaster in her library, um, but after cell towers and all kinds of communication channels were knocked out, the ITDRC, as the acronym is known, uh, can come in and set up sort of mobile command centers and begin to support from an information technology perspective, even when your main your main channels are taken offline. So that, along with lots of other resources, some of which you've heard uh, Rachel talk about. Um, as well, um, the NEDCC, another one um, that's a big player in this in this uh, field too. So, um, do feel free to refer to this toolkit as many times as needed. Um, do start filling out that plan. Um, I've been receiving completed plans from another a number of libraries, which is uh, which is really exciting too. So, um, anything else you want to say about the, the toolkit there, Bun? No, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we uh, we you uh, mentioned it and gave a little tour of it because I think it's a great new resource for uh, library staff and boards to know about. Um, what questions have do you have for Rachel and our remaining time, or what what do you want to share with us about your experience in working through disaster prepping? Rachel, I'll ask a, a question or comment while we wait for our attendees as well. But um, you said something that I think um, is such a such a big thing, and I wonder how libraries can, or maybe maybe it's more of a comment than a question. So sorry to be that person here in the chat, but you mentioned libraries as the it, sort of promoting themselves to your local emergency management based on the value that you bring to a community. I wonder if you can talk a little more about the role that a library can play after a large scale disaster um, strikes strikes an area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a lot of community members, they, be, they know that the library is a source for trusted information. So, when trying to find a place to turn, especially if you can imagine there's no internet, is there a place they can go to find out what's going on? Um, and they may head to town offices, but it may be that that the library would be, it's, it's a natural impulse of many community members to turn to their library. If they, you know, everything from uh, help with tax forms to how do I, how do I apply for this job online to, you know, you all offer so much to your communities in terms of connecting them um, to resources. So there's an, there's an expectation, I think, in many communities that, well, the library will know. We don't know what's going on, but they'll know. Um, and it may be that if you can have explicit conversations with emergency management about, because part of the ICS is to establish a communications person um and and so that there's there again so that the that a consistent message is going out so they don't the first responders don't want to be having to to talk to folks about what's going on but there needs to be a a place where a point person can can share information or that they know they can get it to you from the ICS, from the EOC, you know, that they've set up this center and they've got someone who's getting it from the command center, what's going on, and then sharing it with the library who can then amplify that out to the community. So there's like that basic information sharing. It can also be the other way too and making it clear to your community Look, we need, we want to know how you've been impacted because often that's one of the first things that needs to happen. So, again, depending on the type of emergency or disaster, whether people are going to be mobile and able to get to the library or communicate with the library, but that it be, again, in advance, explicitly stated that we will gather information about our community and its needs in order to share that with the emergency response folks. Um, so there may be a role going that direction as well. 
And then there's just basic things like, depending on the season, keeping people warm or keeping people cool. I mean, even in Vermont last summer, it was so hot, we had some libraries that were open as cooling centers. Um, and again, advertising that they were available for that. Um, and it's certainly in disasters, UL can be a great place for people to go. And you know, one of the important things, of course, is is charging devices and ideally being able to get on the internet. So if there is a way to, to harden your systems to such an extent or have a generator, so you at least are going to be guaranteed to have electricity. And this is where you can work with the town to, if you make the case for your value as that community space in disaster, uh, there may be resources available to you to get what you need in order to do that job even better. Um, and you have spaces that can be used for, for, for gathering, for meetings. Um, there's bathrooms, you know, there's, it, it, it's good. You guys have, you have good facilities for, for, for your communities to use. And if you don't, you could again, use this to get, make some noise and try to get better, get better bathrooms. Damn it. People might need them. So. Yes. No, I think that's, I think that's a great, a great point. Bon, in your experience in Northwest Iowa, what are, um, what are some of the ways that you've seen libraries engaging on this, on this topic, either over the last couple months or, um, you know, in your much longer tenure as a, as a librarian? Well, I think all of those points that Rachel raised are all so valid and they're so important for for the community to think about the library in broader terms in, in as more than as more than just for the the book lovers out there, but as a real community agency, as a city service, as a community hub, and those libraries that are housed inside community buildings, that makes that task even easier. Um, but I think it's a I think it's the raising the awareness about what the library can contribute to an overall community disaster. Um, you know, whenever I think of when the thing I think of always when this topic comes up for me is I think having lived in Sioux City for all these years, I think of Flight 232 crashing in Sioux City. And what was so unique about that is and so coincidental is that the entire countywide emergency management team had just had a drill an emergency drill just just weeks before that plane crash but that was a definite city wide emergency just because of the human toll and the and the toll it took on the hospitals and i know that the library was was very much at that time a hub of the information hub. In fact, at that time of the 232 crash, our downtown Sioux City Library was in its original Carnegie building, right smack across the street from one of the hospitals, right smack across the street. The helicopter pad was right outside the library's doors practically. And so the library really was very much an information source um, for the media, for all kinds of community involvement and people wanting to to help however they could. So it really, to me, is raising that awareness about the library as a great civic partner when times like that happen. I heard um, an interesting story earlier this week as well about, um, I, I know another role the library can play was um, after a large scale disaster in town, um, the library coordinated the efforts with a, another volunteer group that would take and restore family photographs. Oh, so right. the, the members of that community could submit, I don't know if it was one photo per family or you know a certain number of photos per family that had been destroyed. And the library was able to work with a volunteer group to get them retouched and restored and returned um, to the people of that community. So in, in really practical ways, like being the spot mm -hmm. with the generator and a trust, trustworthy bulletin board, um, but also in some of those more sentimental ways. And I've often thought too, it would be interesting for the State Library to do a session on 
um, sort of capturing community voices after an event like yeah. that, you know, the stories that people would have after flight 232 crashed in Sioux right. City. And, um, um, and I think too, after the pandemic here, the, the memories that we want to um, kind of want to forget, <laughs> um, but also, you know, really can't societally afford to forget um, to begin to make archives and, and storage of those. Now, Susan has a comment here, city council talking about purchasing and installing a generator at the library so it can be a center for communication and disaster response. And I think that's a great, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That is a great idea. I know at our um, learning circuit location in Sioux Center um, in October, something we talked about a lot was the supply inventory that shows up on our template and showed up on the other one that Rachel um, had on her slides. A supplies inventory, our group talked about how all supplies are not created equal, right? Our, all, all flashlights are not made equally. All extension cords are not created equal. So to, to have the board in on those discussions about those supplies that the library can have on site and maybe spending a little bit more money for a really heavy duty, powerful extension cords or those or um, boots or those Tupperware tubs um, to have to for to collect materials and really heavy duty flashlights. Um, that was a that was a fun discussion at our at our location. And I think so many people um, agreed that they need to spend a, a few more dollars to get some better, some better supplies, some better equipment. I see we have um, Laura with her hand up and then another comment in chat to address. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, um, I was when Rachel was talking, one thing that I was thinking about and I am a, a board member for the North Liberty Library. Um, I was thinking about what happened um, with the Black Lives Matter and with the protest with George Floyd and with the downtown Iowa City area. It made me think about all of the businesses who um, there were some vandalization with um, spray painting and some broken glass. And it made me think about the Iowa City Library because it is right downtown location. And it just made me wonder um, if they had had something in place. Um, and then I, I know they have programs that they do to work with the community, same within North Liberty. And that just made me think about that and what sort of preparedness they had for a situation. Cause that's not something, you know, you really think is gonna happen, but sometimes it does. So I will let people talk about that. I think that's absolutely something to keep in mind. And um, Rachel can probably speak to this a little bit more intelligently than I can, but uh, we talked, um, one of the terms that you throw around is sort of like, what is it, all all hazards response? So it doesn't really matter why the library is shut down, whether it's a fire or a hurricane or a protest, it just matters that the library is shut down. And so how do you respond to that? But certainly knowing um, you know, having a sense that like, oh, yeah, my library's on Town Square, and I heard that this big event is happening on Town Square, and, you know, being ready to pull out your plan um, is certainly going to be part of that to say, okay, if things get out of hand and we need to shut down, who's going to do the communicating, who's going to, um, who's going to be involved in, you know, who goes to the library first in the morning to survey and, and that sort of thing um, is, is going to be important. And just to add on to that, Sam, it's also important to have people decide when have, what is too far out of hand? Like when, who makes the decision to close and what is the trigger for closure? And especially I think for, for public libraries, it's, I would set the bar pretty high um, in terms of wanting to be a, a wanting to be open and available to your community, um, and not necessarily wanting to 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 harden the building or close yourself off. But there is it's absolutely uh, it, it's going to be a judgment call. But who's going to make that judgment? Is there a way to kind of prepare for different uh, when what what that decision would be depending on what's going on? Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, we heard the example in the learning circuit I attended in Clorinda of 
having a really lovely um, tornado warning plan, I believe was the example, um, in which everyone who was in the library would go to the storm shelters, which was the public bathroom, or which was the bathrooms, uh, which worked great until the tornado warning happened during the largest summer reading program of the year. Um, and, you know, so they had about 80 kids in the library and were trying to figure out, okay, how do we cram 80 kids into, you know, <laughs> two bathrooms um, and, and do we have other options? And so having someone, you know, of course you never plan during a tornado and a tornado is something you can't necessarily predict, but, you know, trying to think through some worst case scenarios is all part of this process as well. Bonnie, do you want to speak to the comment in chat? Um, with the pandemic, my board addressed the need for a new policy for pandemics, which is which is great. Um, it was a lot of work, of course, and then went to the city uh, to see what theirs was, and um, we're told we have none. Frustrating to attempt an emergency policy without help from the city. So, how do you build? How do you build some of those bridges with the city besides some of these things we've already talked about here? Yeah, I I really sympathize with that, Lisa, because I know in in 2020 and it was so incredibly aggravating and scary actually for libraries to feel like they didn't have much in the way of city support. I found in my conversations and, and talks with our Northwest libraries that those who, those libraries fared the best were those libraries in towns where their city governments were very proactive in their response to the COVID crisis and where those city governments even, and of course, this, this, these were some of the some of the bigger towns that had the advantage of HR people on staff and could look toward their city, ad, city administrators and even their city attorneys for guidance. And those guidelines came down then from the city government and it applied to all city workers, to all city buildings, all city departments. And those were the libraries that fared the best. Those had the, the most functioning response. And those that felt like you, Lisa, that felt like, well, here we are trying to figure this out on our own. It was incredibly frustrating. So I think use that as your, as your example in your future conversations, I think, with your boards. Um, it's, I think that's a great entree into maybe board members talking with city council people and talking with city administrators and, you know, being the being that voice of an advocate for the library and needing to be included in those kinds of emergency um, responses. It's a, that was that was a very hard thing. I remember I remember and I so sympathized with all of you who felt so adrift. Um. This is an encouraging comment in the chat. The city does not have a disaster plan, is excited that the library is making one so they can use it as a guide. Yay. I think that's great that if there hadn't been something formal in place, um, that certainly now you guys are all marching to the beat of the same drum because of and course why none not, of- Right, and why not share that template with your city, with your city managers and city people? Because they can fill in their, they can fill in the blanks um, with their with their network of of um, of contacts in the same way you can, and certainly the, your contacts will overlap. But I think why not? What do you think, you guys? Share that template with city government. Absolutely. Um, I think one of my favorite stories I heard in this whole process was a woman who a librarian who had no not a spot of resistance from her board, from her um, city council, from the county. Um, everyone was really supportive and really cooperative until she got to the police chief and said, hey, I don't have a record that you have a copy of the key to the library. Um, I think the police chief ought to have a key to the library. And he said, no, I already carry too many keys. I don't want another key on this keychain." <laughs> and she sort of said like, all right, it's okay. you're gonna take the key, sir, so. <laughs> Um, but I've been hearing a lot of, um, I do feel like in general, I've heard a lot of stories from libraries who, like Lisa said, they kind of met some resistance from the city. A lot of people saying, why are you even bothering with that? Um, but then also a lot of stories like Heidi's too, where people are, um, you know, it's kind of sparked a conversation among the city um, to, to make some stuff happen. So yeah. Um, and I think it's really and we heard in in um, office hours too that there are, I heard from libraries that their boards were really kind of kind of you know sparked by this by this idea of the library 
tackling this um, this template and bringing it to board meetings and sharing it that way as well. Um, Sam, in our time remaining, would you like to um, share with folks the follow-up webinars we have on this yeah, topic absolutely. coming up? We did one just yesterday, which was a great panel discussion. It was recorded, and you'll see that show up soon in, in um, our YouTube channel, but we still have more coming up in December. We absolutely do. And let me grab a couple links here while I'm talking. So excuse my um, double dipping here. But um, the first one kind of speaks to what Rachel said about how we try so hard to keep our libraries open and responsive and supportive in a community, um, but that can also then lead to burnout and trauma among staff. And so um, the first one, uh, the next webinar we have coming up on this topic is called Now What? Caring for Self, Staff, and Community After a Disaster. This is a daytime webinar um, intended for librarians, but I'm sure um, boards will enjoy the recording of it. Um, we have a few uh, local experts um, and national experts speaking on this topic. So, um, of course, no one is going to yoga their way out of a disastrous situation, as I like to say, but um, things that we keep in mind as we're taking care of ourselves and our staff and our volunteers um, who themselves are going through different degrees of trauma, potentially, if there is a large scale disaster. Um, and then the second event that I want to highlight, um, also going to be extremely practical, I think, um, but we'll have a volunteer from a group here in Iowa, which is called I'm Alert. And um, I'm Alert is a resource uh, that you call basically if you have collection damage. So if you do walk into the library and you've got a several inches of water soaking your J nonfiction down in the basement, um, you call I'm Alert and they're going to be a great resource to help you figure out what um, in that collection can be salvaged and should be salvaged and how to salvage it. So um, we've got those two events coming up uh, December 7 and 13, respectively, both uh, during the day, but will be recorded. So very excited about those. Yay. And we did we did take kind of a detour with our with our last half hour together, but um, not to worry. Sam and I are coming back in the new year. Maybe Rachel wants to come back too. She had such fun tonight. She might I want did, to come I back. did. She yes. loves Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I do. We will be back in the new year with another round of the boardroom webinars. And we will certainly come back to this topic of policy watch. Now see, maybe Maybe we do have a good reason to use that as a series title. We will come back to this idea of policies lost and found and share some other um, discussions with you on the topics of social media and programming and, and some other topics not as often addressed. But until then, we thank you ever so much for joining the discussion tonight. And our thanks truly to Rachel for spending her evening this way. She's joined Iowa Libraries not once but twice in the in a matter of two months. And so we're glad to have you here, Rachel, and we so benefit your expertise. Thanks oh, so much. Thank you. Absolutely. It's really been my pleasure. Thank you. Bon, before we hang up, if people are still in the room, I want to tell folks to save the date for ILOC. That will be our next trustee event. Yes. Um, I just put the link in the chat, but um, you uh, will trim off the recording before I get to this part, since we had such a nice end before I word vomited a little bit more here. <laughs> um, but ILOC being our virtual conference, which this year is old enough to drive on its own. ILOC <gasps> turned 16 this year. Oh, holy cow. Um, yeah, right. So um, I put the link in chat. Uh, we will have a session for trustees that night. More info coming, but that will be January 26th, a Thursday day. So excellent. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks. Good night. Yep. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks for being here.